Awesome. Hi, everyone. Jason Healy with Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Um, on behalf of my collaborator, Lance Weiler, who's with the um, Digital Storytelling Lab of Columbia University's School of the Arts, we wanted to welcome you um, for this, which is one of the, one of the kickoff events for, for DFRAG, Columbia University's Hacked Film Festival. We have just an amazing event uh, for you this evening, um, starting off with Colossus, the Forbin Project, uh, one of the first movies that really had the computer as the antagonist, the computer as a main character, followed by an, an amazing panel of hackers and computer security experts um, who are going to talk about the movie and talk about hacking and talking about art and talking about all sorts of amazing things. Um, I hope you are ready. Um, I am ready. Um, with beer and popcorn. Um, so to tell you about, um, oh, and we're gonna try and watch it synchronized. So if you've started it, put it on pause <laughs> um, because next I'm gonna hand it to Chris Painter um, who was um, America's first senior cyber diplomat. In fact, he was probably the first senior cyber diplomat anybody in the world that was operating as a, um, uh, to help talk about all of the issues that are raised by this movie and cyber war and cyber peace. So he'll be, he'll be doing a short introduction to the movie. He'll be turning it over to Andrea Peterson, who will be the moderator of the event, and she'll go through some short logistical items. So about DFRAG, it is Columbia's Hacked Film Festival, and the title gets what we mean, right? The DFRAG is a, a computer process of taking what was once separate and bringing it together. And so what we wanna do with DFRAG is to talk about and demystify hackers and hacking. Um, all too often um, in fiction and film, hackers are, are, are represented as um, the evil ones or the misunderstood ones in the hoodies and you can never really figure out what, what's going on. And the stories of hackers are so much richer than that. Um, Matt DeVoe, who is here, um, it says a lot about how hackers, the primary uh, trait to describe themselves is curiosity. Um, that say, if you give us a tech, hackers a technological object, so often when we're given a technological object, we're told how it can be used. We're given strict rules about how we ought to behave with it. And hackers are those that say, no, it's not up to you, it's up to us to decide how we're going to use this technological object. And as, of course, as technology becomes more, I'm sorry, as society becomes more technological, um, it's those that understand and can manipulate the technology who have these central roles as, as heroes or as anti-heroes or as villains. And so we want to explore that through interactive means, through storytelling, through, through film, through um, fiction and, uh, and the rest. So wanted to um, thank our sponsors, uh, UBS, the, the Global Swiss Bank, uh, especially Neil Pollard, uh, as well as the Hewlett Foundation, uh, Kelly Bourne, who's there now, as well as Eli Sugarman and, and Manu Ruiz, um, who has since moved on and is now at Microsoft. Thank you very much for making this happen, um, as well as to Bo Woods, um, uh, who organized today's event, as well as the team, Sean Steinberg and Veer, um, Veer Pratt Vikram Singh, all to, to my wife who's uh, had some of the initial ideas to push this and, and has helped make it happen over the years. Um, with that, let me pass over to Chris Painter. Hello everyone, it's great to have you here today. This, this, um, this really, not just as a kickoff event for this series, but just as a film in its own, uh, I think is, it's become a cult film. It was really the first movie where computers took over the world. 14 years, 1970s when it was released, 14 years before Terminator, before War Games, before all those other movies about computers. But unfortunately, like many of the movies about computers, it's a dystopian movie where computers take over the world, in this case, to protect mankind or humankind from itself. Uh, so this, this is something that I think really uh, bears watching now for lots of reasons. It has many parallels, even though it's 50 years later to some of the debates we're having today about civil liberties, uh, versus uh, authority, about artificial intelligence and the uses of that, about technology being good or bad or dangerous. It taps into those fears that humankind has, but it also taps into the promise that, that these technologies could, could lead to. And so 
it's a very timely film, even though it's 50 years old. And it, and it deals with the Russia-US tensions, which are obviously still in play today. So many things to watch for in this film. Uh, many funny things, many serious things, and, and well worth it. I should say, from my own perspective, this film oddly helped shape my career. When I was, uh, when I saw this movie in, my, in the theaters, in the Cherry Hill Cinema, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, home of the first covered shopping mall. Uh, me and my best friend, Alan Myers, who's also watching this podcast tonight, uh, sat through this movie two and a half, I think three times actually, before we, uh, before we tired of it. Uh, and for, I was obsessed with this movie uh, for many years thereafter. And I used it as my model and to, get, to really get into cyber security and cyber policy. So it really changed my life. I hope it will change yours in some sense. I hope that all of you can react and, and see parallels or things in this that are valuable. We'll have a great discussion afterwards. Really look forward to all of you uh, being there with us. And I'm now uh, happy, and again, we'll be commenting throughout the film, but we'll have a great panel afterwards. And I'm happy now to turn it over uh, to Andrea, who's going to give us some, uh, some logistical and other details. So Andrea, over to you. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us and for that great intro oh, uh, from everyone. Uh, just a few logistics. Uh, you are going to be doing all of our chatting over here in the Zoom. Our panel will be at 745 here in the Zoom, but we do need to go over to the other site to actually stream the film. You should have gotten that information in through your email, including a password, and it should also be in the chat over here. So if you're having any trouble, we'll put it in and we'll, uh, yeah, Sean just helped us out there. We got it all over. So uh, consider streaming on two screens in case you want all of our uh, ridiculous and timely commentary. Thank you so much for watching that with us. I know we should be on the credits now. And because we're running a tiny bit behind, I think we're gonna get started on the panel here in just a second. And so everybody settle in, get excited for a conversation about world control. Excuse me, Colossus, the Forbin Project. And we are here uh, with uh, support from Columbia's Digital Storytelling uh, and Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs. I'm Andrea Peterson from Plain Great Productions and a longtime technology journalist and who focuses specifically on cybersecurity and government accountability. You can find me generally on Twitter as Kansas Alps because of a long word pun that I'm not going to explain here. But more importantly, we have a fabulous panel of other experts here. And I'm going to have us start by going around the room, explain, introducing ourselves just a little bit and explaining you know, our favorite parts of the films. And I'm going to start with Chris, because I know Chris gave us a little intro beforehand, but just for anybody new, Chris, can you give us your full background with this film and how it has influenced your life? The abbreviated version, the TLDR, since we've got the whole thing on the full intro. Oh, and tell us another thing that you, or a specific thing that you love about this film. So it's hard just to pick one. I really love everything about this film. As I said, as a, you know, in grade school, I sat through this movie two and a half, almost three times. I became obsessed with it. It was just, you know, I was, I loved computers. I love the idea of computers. Uh, but this whole idea of technology and how it plays, uh, in our lives, just as something that obsessed me and, and it kind of controlled where I went with my life, you know, you know, I, to be sure I went to law school and was a lawyer, but, but I always cared about computers and computer movies and, and cybersecurity and cyber crime uh, in the early days, really getting involved in that in the, in the early nineties and late eighties. Um, and, you know, this also was the first movie for those of you who know, know me and actually for those of you who don't know me, it doesn't really make a difference. <laughs> I, uh, I, I tried to make my State Department office uh, more unique by having movie posters where computers or, or hackers were the main character. And this was the first one. This was, there's an earlier movie called Death Set with Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn, which is a legitimately great movie, which is different. But this is really the paradigm movie that, that starred that collection. And I had 70 uh, movies that I, that I highlighted. And so, but, but this, this movie just has so much in it, so many great things. When I was in the White House, when I was uh, the acting coordinator of this White House and senior director, I had the Colossus symbol um, right here, 
on my door <laughs> because it's C and it's coordinator. And so that makes sense. So it's just something, something that just always intrigued me. And, and it's almost a timeless movie, I think, because as you saw the themes, you know, Russia, the US, civil liberties versus uh, state control, all these themes I think are just as vibrant today as they were 50 years ago. In fact, many of them are far more vibrant today than they were when this film was made, which I think is very much a, a, a groundbreaking film in, in many ways. So, so um, you know, I, uh, I'm happy to be here with this panel. I'm happy to share this event. Uh, more people need to know about this movie. Uh, and, and I know it's hard to find, but I'm glad we were able to do this. Same here. I had a blast watching this in preparation, re-watching it with all of y'all now. Uh, so much so, especially since it's been a little bit of a reunion for me and Haley Tsukuyama, who reported together on tech work at the Washington Post for years. And with that intro, I'm going to let Haley introduce herself and her role now a little bit more and give us uh, her fave little film moment. Um, thank you, Andrea. It's really nice to see you too and to hear you. Um, as Andrea mentioned, she and I worked together at the uh, at the Washington Post, where I was a tech reporter for about eight years. Um, and for the past few years, I've been legislative activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, focusing on a lot of the issues that came up in this movie. Um, this is the first time I've ever seen it, so it's like hard for me to pick a favorite point right out of the right off the bat. But I do a lot of work on privacy and privacy legislation, and what does privacy mean and so I really did find that conversation between Foreman and Colossus about privacy as weird as it was set in the like gender um, <laughs> dynamic piece of the movie but I did find that conversation really interesting um, so I have to think about it a little more. Andrea there's one thing I want to just add uh, I didn't say my favorite part of the movie was and I'd say the ending you know where <laughs> But when the computer is saying, you will help me, you will love me in time, and he keeps saying never, I thought that was just a great way to end it. And I should also explain my background here, my Zoom background, is the actual Colossus from Bletchley Park in the UK. And unlike Colossus, the Forbin project, which is very dystopian, this computer, first digital programmable electronic computer, kept secret by the Brits in the mid 70s, so they never got any commercial advantage, but was used to break the Nazi Lorenz code which was the higher code than Enigma. And actually, so the real Colossus helped save the world versus the uh, movie Colossus that enslaved it. I love all of that history. Thanks so much. And I'm gonna throw it over er, now to another one of our panelists, Ron Gula. Like Ron, tell us a tiny bit about yourself. Well, you know, a medium a bit about yourself and then your favorite part before we kick it over to Amelie. How's it going? Uh, Ron Gula from Gula Tech Adventures. We do all sorts of good things with investing and nonprofits and cybersecurity. I, I love this movie. I really appreciate you guys kicking off the uh, your, your series here with picking a movie such like this. My, my favorite part in the movie is when Colossus and Guardian start talking. When they start talking and you can actually see the, the look of horror and all the scientists face uh, it's like a true sign of intelligence. Like they're really thinking that nobody else can 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 do this. Absolutely favorite part of the movie. And, and then of they course, essentially I love create the in sort of, encryption. Um, I'll talk about it more later. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm sorry to cut you off there, but since we've got so much to off, I'll go ahead and say kick it over to Amelie. Yeah, for the last of our panelist introductions, and we'll dig deeper oh. into everything. All right, yeah, no problem. Um, so Amelie Cran, I'm a senior technology advocate at Splunk, but prior to that, like Chris, I, I'd done some time at the White House, been private public sector. Generally, you look for me, I think I mentioned in the chat, I was on um, uh, Darknet Diaries recently talking about IR and stuff, but yeah, no, talking about the movie in, in general, like this is my first viewing of it. I know a lot of people like love this movie, but I've got other movies I actually hold near and dear, but um, you know, it's interesting, like, you know, doing all the research and you, you follow the stuff I posted in, in the thread. It was just one of these cases of so many of these actors uh, and production people have gone on to other major uh, franchises and so forth. You know, James Hong into Blade Runner. A lot of folks have gone into Knight Rider and whatnot. So it's it, it carries the blood 
of you know what was started in this film into other franchises and it kind of spreads it out and i'm sure you know knowing how it is in 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 production in in hollywood and and the film and tv industry and and i had some ancillary stuff involved there too if you look at my background um you know they they definitely brought their experiences on there and some of the insights that they work with probably the directors and, and writers and producers there so I, you know it's just like i said this is this 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 film carries so much dna um, forward and I just love to kind of see those connections you know especially like at the end that little ball a microphone there you know we're all talking into probably these blue microphones that people use for podcasting like literally nothing has changed in a way um, but you know just kind of the sniping of you know why are things that are, are electronic have these mechanical sounds like there's just, there, there's there's the, the, that transition from kind of a more technology anachronistic moment to where we're into the digital era that was definitely one of those things you saw in that film. And then, you know, obviously explode things out into, you know, all of the policy discussions about AI and, and whatnot that we're seeing nowadays is, is obviously, you know, something that we can kind of bring up in this discussion. And I didn't really give my favorite thing, but one of them was really the aesthetics of everything in this film that does like it's very clearly set in the 70s uh, for those who weren't around for or the chat. I do want to flag that Amelie was dropping awesome notes that she dotted up so you may want to scroll back up if you can to see like a weird crossovers of which actors and actresses showed up in here including in the mom um, from happy days uh so now i have the sunday monday happy days song stuck in my head whenever she came on screen we, we needed fonzie to just give a hip check to Colossus. really like yeah, it's kind of like hey you know surely he could have convinced the Fonz could have convinced Colossus to give him some more or privacy. Uh, but one of the things I really appreciated was that it, uh, as Chris mentioned, that it felt really still timeless. And I think part of that is because we see even in these clunkier formats, a lot of the technologies that we're even using today, like it's video phones everywhere, right? Which is like the FaceTime in your pocket or your signal encrypted video oh, chat that I hope God, God, some of you are using. Um, but like we, we get these glimpses into the design of a world that still feels very fresh and modern, even if like the uh, suits are cut differently or, or the computers take up say entire rooms or, or entire contractors sleep next to their workplace you know that that they coming uh... in the the bed robe you know just kind of like okay sure look they predicted an always on workforce which i think a lot of people in the cybersecurity world can probably relate to so on that point uh let's pitch it, it on and talk a little, little bit about how we feel about like the opsec of things within this film. I know in the chat, Haley mentioned, and uh, one, at one point they're just like talking about a plan over a line that they know is monitored by the computer. Just, like, picked up that handset, just didn't call anybody, just like held it. To talk. Any other like major terrible offset things people remember? <laughs> other than the entire time that everything's constantly being surveilled. <laughs> the panopticon. Well, I think especially early on, you know, before they gave it cameras and microphones and everything, it's like, lie more. Why did not, why didn't you lie more to the computer? I realized it has missiles, but, um, you know, I, it does, it was really interesting for me to see. I mentioned a couple of times, like, A, the scientists were pretty optimistic, like throughout a pretty hefty chunk of the movie. Like it didn't seem like maybe until... 45 minutes or so in that it really sunk in that this that they were in trouble um which i thought was interesting and like i don't know i just the the threat model was not very good <laughs> yeah i mean I, I also think there was one point in the film they say every phone has been wired other than the hotline into colossus why yeah. <laughs> it, made no, it made no sense given what its mission was right so <laughs> I love the SS7 reference uh, as a, a shout out uh, that I did a major investigation about uh, the continuing like issues with SS7 and, and like cell signal routing for Ars Technica and the project on government over Earth that led to a congressional investigation with like uh, Senator Warren and some other and rep uh, from Lejay uh, Paul. Uh, so I am like, I love, I love somebody make, 
taking the SS7 flag and I see it was actually Amelie. So Amelie, let's pitch it over and talk about it. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, there we go. So I made a call out to uh, the fact that uh, you in 1970, uh, the uh, DTMF was still a brand new thing. So the idea of touch tone phones wasn't entirely new. So the, the whole concept of like a digital uh, phone line was was absolutely uh, you know, groundbreaking there. So like, if you're looking at that film in, in space and time, like that probably wowed audiences beyond the fact that you're seeing computers on screen, uh, control data corporation, you know, we're still pushing punch, punch cards and tape tape there, but, um, you know, to understand that, you know, signal signaling system seven SS seven, you know, was your first, uh, aspect of, uh, really digital switching for phone systems, you know, where, you know, I, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm here in Washington now, but my first, my first job outside of the DC area was actually in LA and I got to go into a, a brand new, um, a U.S. West facility where it went from these, uh, the digital switching, which are like four or five, uh, you know, gray boxes to where this whole analog, uh, you know, DC system, which powered your phone company, you know, took up the rest of the building as you strung, strung these copper lines and it just strung out. And you just kind of see like the evolution of technology just within, you know, maybe like an 80, you know, 80 by 20 square foot area. And, uh, you know, I could just imagine seeing that film at the time is like, where can we get these touch tone phones? Like we're still dialing, like joking about the fact that like, if you're making a phone call, if you're still in those rotary dials, like that's like five minutes of screen time. And they're the boop, 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 boop. Okay. We got the president on the line. Like that, that's, like I said, again, this is one of these kind of like groundbreaking things you see in this movie, even though it's like total cheese to kind of watch. And the, the other thing just on OPSEC is that the sit room was, uh, first of all, not at all realistic. The real sit room is just Much a, smaller a, and, and very depressing when you see it because you expect something that's going to be really big and you get there and it's like it's a conference room. But yeah. secondly, you know, they were letting anyone in the sit room. It's like, you know, people could just show up anytime. Reporters were there with cameras. They showed up. They left. You know, they came back. It was or even the, the Colossus complex. So not a lot of security. And I, I think one of the most amazing things is whoever had the policy making process and says we're going to do this colossus and we're going to make it impenetrable and we're just going to let it go uh without any checking seems to have not done their dcs and pcs were not well done <laughs> yeah again but going back to the point that ron sort of pointed out as one of his favorite moments is just when the computers are talking to each other and invent in the end encryption yeah. <laughs> it's just like you know watching a baby walk <laughs> It's actually, so my wife and I have two boys and the first time that they talk to each other, I actually flash back to Colossus. Like that's intelligence. That's what it looks like. That's amazing. And I also think How it's do pretty they do cool that a lot of us like, are, yeah. like they're so passing us are science fiction fans. Yeah. And I think Colossus would have fed into Asimov's world of iRobot because technically aside from blowing up some people and assassinating <laughs> them, he's really not doing a lot of harm to the human race. Yeah, just a few minor murders, like that's you know good for the good of humanity, uh, according to uh, the clauses. And that's right. and that's the whole theme. What is harm to the human race? If you take away free will, isn't that harm? I mean, Colossus thinks no. Well, then uh, they then again, the illusion. But then again, they flew to Italy right after like a nuke attack. So like you know, we we had September 11th, and we were shut down for quite a long period of time. And like a day later, like yeah, we'll fly to Rome. Like it was okay, a that was a meteorite. A meteor <laughs> Meteorite, yes, yeah. Lots of lots of awesome powers. You know, the strategically placed glasses there for the nude scenes and whatnot. Like, there's a lot of callbacks that you got to give some directors and DPs uh, credit for, like where they're pulling those references from. Especially the lighting. You know, just making sure the shadows kind of hitting the right areas. Well, I don't. I don't think the movie's gotten enough credit for, as, as you said, how many how it's featured in and films afterwards that borrow things from it. Even comedy things like, you know, in our chat we talked about. Uh, you know the Mike Myers movies stealing the glass placement over the you know over the naughty bits, uh, you know how that was just lifted from this movie, uh, and it wasn't meant to be comedic here, although it came across as pretty comedic. <laughs> the movie Dune is coming out, and there's a documentary called Jadowarski's Dune about trying to make yes. Dune in the 1970s, and yeah. he's credited with many many things, including the first heads up display. And when, I don't know what those waves and things were when Colossus was looking, it certainly wasn't infrared, but it was some sort of heads up display. And I thought that was cool. Jadawasi's Dune documentary is so killer. And 
like just general recommendation if you would like to watch something incredibly trippy is to yeah. do anything Jodowski that has made <laughs> like it's they are surrealists they are like peak 70s and only recommendations yeah a lot of his stuff and uh the stuff that Ridley Scott did a lot of intertwined with you know both directors are very art directory centric so you know everything was based on vision necessarily story so like that was that was an entirely visual thing so yeah you know i guess the question is one, one of the funny things would be if the, they made a sequel to this movie who who would have directed uh you know uh would it be uh you can imagine a number of people where it'd be just kind of crazy um uh including you know including john Orowski, you know he'd, he'd done it but um but it wasn't clear from the end of it that that was really the end you can imagine mm -hmm. 10 years on that either he defeated Colossus or he's now working for Colossus happily as Colossus predicted. You know what the ending reminded me of? Another classic 70s film that is one of my top films of all time, Network. Mm -hmm. uh, where you've got yeah. a fade, like where you've got a fade out of like a setting that implies a continuing ecosystem of uncertainty, but you can make some predictions about what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Network, what year was Network? Oh, I want to say it's later 70s, but I am not sure. I'm going to, but I have the magic of a Google machine. I think it's like somebody actually, it's actually a little bit earlier, if I remember. 73, 75, I think. So no, Colossus no, does no. have a sequel. It was originally a book. There were two books in the trilogy. The second one was Network. The Fall of Colossus, where I shit you not, aliens from Mars <laughs> send a communication to a mathematical problem to, you know, break Colossus down. The truth is and out then, there. Yeah, the third book is called Colossus and the Crab, where the Martians come to Earth and they're like, we're yeah. going to take like half of your air. And and Forbin basically resurrects Colossus and Colossus like, I'm going to go with the aliens plan. And I kid you not. They should they should have stopped. They did stop at one. Uh, my friend suggested that David Lynch would have been a great uh, person to do the sequel and we still wouldn't understand it. But <laughs> but but I, I think I think those two books probably didn't do Colossus any favors. <laughs> No, they didn't. I think I did. I mean, as I said, this is the first time I watched the movie. So I was trying to do research around, I was trying not to spoil the plot for myself, but I was trying to do research around it. And I did see that there had been talks of a remake starting Will Smith, which like, I really have to think about. Um, but I was like, who would I cast in like a, in a remake or a sequel? And that's like a, that's a tough one for me. Well, that was, that was one of the reasons I put in near the end of the film there about in like 1970, like what we were seeing, like we got the aristocrat, uh, Aristocats from Disney, you know, we're still getting Westerns from Peck and Paw. Uh, yeah. Very surrealistic, you know, stuff from Roger Ebert as the writer for Valley, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Uh, you know, addressing the, 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 gay, the, the gay community and the boys in the band. Uh, surreal stuff from Altman with like Bruce McCloud and Catch-22, which if you've never seen Catch-22, that is a bizarre ass film. Like if you yeah, want yeah. some trippy shit, like that's that. Um, yes. But yeah, I mean like, just what you see what was the output of film and culture at that point in time and then there's this like i went through that entire list and looked like there was nothing touching on technology like nothing that was anything approaching this here so this was really kind of at that point where you know it entered, entered the sphere of media like the, the think years later like you know even in 75 and like we got jaws and stuff like that like you're seeing technology on the film with the, the audio animatronics that was, was yeah. jaws and stuff like that but we didn't really kind of see you know this sci-fi aspect until like star wars in 77 and aliens in 1979 and so forth i think we saw was it um oh, can i counterpoint I, that was, yeah. go ahead go ahead Andrea. my counterpoint is 2001 a space odyssey yes I was which i think say. is 68 69 69 yeah, 60s yeah but a little backstory on that colossus was supposed to be released that same year and they held it back because they didn't want to compete with 2001 so they were originally contemporary films Alas, but, but but again, Perhaps they could have been switched. Yeah, but again, with like Star Trek, Aliens, Star Wars, like you know, Battlestar Galactica, the TV series in '80, yep. you saw you saw this as a marketable pro property that it entered the consciousness. Like, I, I still think like if you're looking at say 2001, it's still very trippy. Like, it's more like oh, science fiction. Yeah. Here, it's more grounded because you're you're attaching a um, a more uh, socio geopolitical context to it. 
than you would with say 2001 which is more of a, a space fantasy type kind of thing so and that's the thing is like you know again like looking at the films like you know just even like Patton like we're still doing films about World War II that is the mindset you know, much like we saw here with Colossus it's it's the Russians versus the Americans we're still kind of carrying that message forward and and that is that that's that's the part that's this 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 uh, zeitgeist of that point where you're doing that filmmaking. But it's very interesting. In 1970, uh -huh. the Russians and the U.S. were obviously not you know not friends. Uh, but this movie really didn't play that up. They really played mm -hmm. up them getting together on this common thread in a in a really interesting way, especially for mm -hmm. that program. All right, guys, we, I have one more question and then we're going to turn over to audience Q&A. It's going to be weirdly framed, but go with the zeitgeist. Stay with me. So, oh, for this film, we've established that it, we think it is a dystopian take on it's the kind of utopian idea, perhaps, of a machine that controls uh, for humanity's worst nature to create war. Now, Sci-fi, like science fiction writers and tech leaders, including Elon Musk, have been making warnings around artificial intelligence for a long time and like public forums being like, we have to worry about the computers taking over the world, old terminators, and as it turns out, Colossus by extension. Alternatively, Elon Musk's partner, the musician Grimes, has recently made a series of videos uh, arguing that artificial intelligence may be the fastest path to a sort of utopian, a communist where artificial intelligence controls things instead of, say, uh, to reduce the amount of, say, a forced uh, farming operations. Do we think this film supports the Grimes theory or the Musk theory? It's a yes or no question, one or the other, and then we're going to the audience. I'm gonna start with Chris. Musk or Grimes? I, I'd have to say Musk. Okay. But but I'd, I again, it's not the machine. It's what it's garbage in, garbage out. It's the programming of the machine. Yes, it's the biases of the machine. All right, you're only allowed 15 to 30 seconds explanation. New rule, oh, Haley, go. Grimes or Musk? I'd also say Musk. I mean, maybe Grimes, but for who, right? Who gets to be in the utopia? That's like another question we have when we talk about AI. Perfect. Hopefully we will get to do more exploration of that in the Q&A. Ron, Musk or Grimes? Yeah, I, I agree with the panel so far, Musk. All right, a lot of dystopians, Amelie, Musk or Grimes? Leaning towards Musk, but uh, you know, I live in a family right now looking at Star Trek and Star uh, Star Wars, so I would like like to lean towards Grimes, but I know it's absolutely unachievable where we are socially right now, so. There is no ethical consumption in, uh, under capitalism. All right, going to the Q&A. Yeah, I know we've already had some awesome stuff being ch uh, dropped in the chat. So I'm going to queue up a little bit to go to the one. Uh, and I apologize if I'm saying your, your name wrong, uh, Ian. Uh, what does the panel think of the foretelling of AI, uh, uh, machine learning with the speed Colossus kept learning, asking questions, trying its boundaries, et cetera? And what does it mean when it comes to balancing security with innovation? The scientists in the movie and Corbin were excited at the prospect of the technology, but they all, all clearly regretted it by the end. Should we be worried of what's to come in our future? I think it's a good expansion from our uh, Musker Grimes conversation. Does anyone want to pitch off? Yeah, I'll take that. So I think that the speed thing is an example that they don't understand what they created. And a lot of times when I talk to, I get pitch companies all the time. We use AI, we use complex machine learning, complex, you know, big data systems. And a lot of times when I ask the, the CEO or the founder how things work, they, they, they can't articulate it to me in enough detail where I can extrapolate, does this scale? When does it break? And that's exactly what happened here. Forbin created something that he didn't understand. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I think as soon as they didn't understand what it was saying to each other, to the two machines, that's where they just kind of lost it. And that's really the fear of AI now that, you know, if it's predictable, if you understand where the algorithm is going, if you can predict where things are going, people feel confident. If you can't, whether AI is used for designing new things or used for, you know, cyber, cyber command, uh, either way, taking the person out of the middle of that equation, you know, makes people really nervous. And I think for good reason. 
Yeah. And I would say too, like, you know, that piggybacking of what you folks are saying, like, because I look at stuff through the lens of legislation, like that's my job. Um, when companies can't articulate or explain sort of where they're going, and then you have g government trying to regulate and like come in and try to craft laws that don't hurt, you know, that security versus innovation question, right, then it becomes an even more of a muddled mess. And so it's like, how do you like, a lot of, a lot of times we're thinking about definitions, we're looking at definitions and bills. And we're like, is that, is that what an automated decision making system is? Is that what AI is? Is that what machine learning is? How do I even put this into legislative language? And so um, that's like a huge problem that we have. Yeah, so I put in the, the comments here, like for me, I see in direct parallel, you know, I think in I, I think in pop culture media, so Jurassic Park, uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm is literally, you know, the chorus there, you know, just the line that everyone uses, you know, I tell you the problem with scientific power that you're using here, you didn't require any discipline to attain it. It's the aspirations versus reality, mm -hmm. understanding that you're building this sometimes without actually kind of really digging deeper. Uh, you know, the whole thing is like, do, do you need to disrupt uh, you know, ride sharing, like with Uber, is it something that needs to disrupt or is it just easy to do to make a quick buck? Uh, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, Ron mentioned he gets pitched AI and ML stuff all the time. Does the application beget a need? Um, you know, it, it, there's ethics behind there's, there's, there's a concept of security behind it. Like what are the controls behind it? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm editing a, a paper on the, the cyber NTSB right now and understanding like, you know, people do things to, to match a regulation or a standard, but they never go beyond that. They never think beyond, they never they never game the system. And that's one of those cases is, is here is like, I think with the, the, the Foreman project here is that they, they built to a design, but never thought of what's beyond. And I think that's one of the, the challenges within cybersecurity is here is, 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 is actually like game theory to actually really, really kind of think about like where, where things will most possibly go, like adversarial modeling. Uh, you know, developers should be doing that, but they aren't. Uh, you know, while people, you know, most of a lot of the stuff that we've seen come up in the news are literally valid use cases to stuff that's been designed and delivered to the public, but they go beyond the steps that people have actually imagined. And those are the things that we really kind of need to consider. Thanks so much for that. And going on, on kind of on that, those sort of same topics on how or the policies impact things today, I wanted it to say thanks again to UBS and Hewlett Foundation for helping make everything tonight happen. And link over to a question in from Monica uh, Ruiz, who is over at Hewlett, which is the movie is very much ahead of its time and touches on many policy issues that are relevant today. After we watch it, like what is on top of our minds going forward? What is the most concrete modern day policy analog that you think of while watching this or having just watched it? Because we just did. So this is a weak analogy, but you know, for anybody who hasn't watched the modern Westworld series where Westworld kind of uses all the data to kind of control society, I think there's a parallel there. You know, this really isn't a movie about social media. It's about control through, you know, nuclear annihilation. But you could easily see it kind of heading that way if you imagine them building machines that were like replicants or, or androids. Yeah, definitely. Like the freedom is an illusion point also makes me think about, oh, sort of the digital echo chambers that we do live in on social media and how oh, like our concept of choice is based on what our options are perceived to be. And so much of those are what we're presented with online, which is also why we're now, you know, in the midst of a lot of antitrust work. I think for me, it's, it's you know, it presents this technology as many of these movies do. I mean, almost all computer movies are dystopian. There's very few, I mean, I would say Sneakers is not, although it has dystopian mo mo moments and there's some others that don't. But, you know, I, th I think it creates this binary, uh, way of looking at this where the technology itself is bad in some way. And I, I don't think that's really accurate. I think technology is neither good nor bad. It's it's how it's used. It's the people who program it. In this case, the computer is being asked to make value judgments. It's just not weighing things. It's fed all human knowledge. And then it's just not going to crank out an answer. It has to make value judgments. It has to weigh different parts of that knowledge to come to a conclusion. And that is programmed. So it's how people use it. Uh, you know, when we think, think about technology, AI, and anything else now, we see great technologies being used for good and bad around the world. We see the same technology used that allows people to connect to allow more repressive regimes to, to uh, monitor their citizens. So if we look at this policy 
area through a clearer lens of what we're trying to do and realize that it's really the the human decisions that control this, I think we'd have a more clear-eyed view of how to do it rather than just be scared of technology or running and embracing technology. Sort of building on that point of you, uh, Colossus has been fed on all human knowledge. Who has collected that human knowledge? Like who, it's constantly referring in the film to, oh, like your history record, who compiled the history and like what biases are in that are something that they don't really address, but I think is like such an important part of uh, the policy conversation we have now around a lot of things involving big data, especially including like civil rights enforcement. And, and especially as we get towards a world where we're at least as surveilled in terms of like in public places by a closed circuit cameras or like ring cameras from Amazon as uh, Forbin was by a Colossus there. Yeah, the that's- The thing in the movie yeah. is, is they, they apparently solved all of computer security, right? They never had to patch Colossus. It was a perfect algorithm. There was no buffer overflows in the FTPs that move files into the computer. They, they, they solved that. So good job, scientists. <laughs> and I think Amelie was moving in there with a point too as well. Yeah, no, I was I was going to comment on a prior one, you know, the year after that, we had THX 1138, so anybody's a big fan of George Lucas, the whole <laughs> progressive dystopian society thing. But when you make a, a, a point about, like, with the AI and input, like, I think about, like, Fifth Element, the, the uh, um, Luke Besson film there, where, you know, the Fifth Element rapidly intakes uh, the history of the, the planet. And makes an assumption that like all we are is like we're, we're self-destructive we like to fight i mean that's just one of those things is like what if you look at you know the colossus as a newborn baby and that's a lot of times like what computing is kind of treated as like you give birth to this ai it has to learn what is the history that we're giving it to kind of create this corpus on there and if it, that corpus is literally defined by by war by poverty by hunger it determines that humans really need, you know, basically need to get purged. Uh, you can look at this, uh, you know, even like even the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that whole, you know, thing with Thanos. Like that's the idea. Like that, that, that has another theme to it. And I don't know how many people actually kind of look uh, back upon themselves of like, you know, that is, you know, we we can go along this dystopian path and and you know play out whatever you know the colossus thing would go and do or any you know fifth element type kind of thing if it went sideways or we follow those more idyllic clean lines of uh you know guardians of the galaxy or you know uh or even even like logan's run it's clean but you're gonna get die because you've reached a certain age or star trek so like you know what what path are we following or, or do we find this middling kind of dirty universe that lucas gave us with like star wars and whatnot you know, is it going to be a lived in thing or even Blade Runner, like as it's much dystopian. dystopian as that was, that was more or less like this is the path that we just kind of like go meh about. And that's what we have. We have our androids. They serve a purpose. We have our weird policy things that we're moving off planet because we didn't address our climate situations. <laughs> but we're still back here on Earth. You know, like it's uh, it's you know, Philip K. Dick was an amazing author in that respect. Uh, you know, same thing with Asimov. Like, I think those uh, are very good contemporaries in that space. I love where this conversation has gone. I want to bring up a comment from the chat here from Emma uh, Schroeder that watching this movie, it appears to be very obvious to all of us that the scientists and politicians in the movie did not fully understand the potential consequences of their creation. This is a side note. It's the classic Frankenstein, uh, Dr. Frankenstein problem. Uh, do you think that part of this immediate reaction that we are having is partly uh, due to works of fiction like this in which we played out scenarios, when, excuse me, which have played through such worst case scenarios. To put it more glibly, in a world without science fiction, uh, are we more vulnerable? Uh, so I actually, I've got an answer for this one and then I will throw it out to the panel. Uh, I really, I was talking with a science fiction author, or uh, Tara E. Bisson, who I'm going to plug, has a great utopian thing based on uh, uh, a world where John Brown's Harper's Ferry Raid succeeds and creates an Afro-communist utopia in the southern United States. It's called Fire on the Mountain. It's super good. But I spoke with him last summer, and one of the points that we were talking about was the importance of utopian fiction, but also that utopian fiction is a lot harder generally because dystopians 
have natural conflicts in them. And in a utopia, if all of your problems are solved, it's harder to create a narrative. So to a certain extent, it's just easier to write science fiction dystopias because there are richer stories to be mined in there than if we have a world that is just like the Thomas More utopia, right? Um, but I'd love to hear what other people will think about this as a storytelling. So I think the parallel is, you know, a couple of you were reporters, how many fun, good, positive stories <laughs> you write versus the ones that are highlighting conflict and bad things. People don't like, I mean, people always talk about have, wanting good news stories, but they don't really want good news stories. They don't want happy things. They want things that where there are conflict and where, uh, you know, there's this dystopian uh, take. And so, you know, I, I can't imagine I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of all those 75 films and they're very few. I'd say Death Set because she played a research librarian, Catherine Hepburn was replaced by a thinking machine, but then they fell in love and the thinking machine got kicked out. Uh, so I guess that was a positive movie, but everything else you can think of, Sneakers maybe, uh, Her was dystopian. I mean, I just don't, I think that's what people like and it makes for drama and, and, you know, and a, a happy ending does not usually play very well or make much money, I don't think, or, lead to more readers, unfortunately. You know, and I'd make the art, uh, I'd question that a little bit, but I pointing out that people love to share cute animal photos. And to a certain, like there was definitely a time in like the news journals and business where there was an incentive to do like strange feel good stories with like the clickbaity headline because the algorithms preferred them at those times. And in fact, it was much harder, I thought, to get eyeballs on more nuanced investigative stories. Although more nuanced investigative stories don't always necessarily mean good juicy conflict either, which is a whole other media journalism and misinformation thing, which also reminds me, there was a, some interesting media misinformation in there. Do we wanna uh, weigh that for a second while I look for another reader question? Like, did we, uh, did we feel like they did a very good cover up? <laughs> Well, well, you know, you would call it the time and still currently there, there's this phrase Soviet history, right? Revisionist history. So, the, so the, the Soviet Union was very good at this kind of messaging. Uh, the U.S. probably too. I mean, I, I, I wasn't really surprised that they did that, but, uh, but clearly they were able to do misinformation much better back then because there were only three or four, I don't know who the hell MB, NBC is um, as one of the networks, but there are only a couple of like television networks and there really wasn't as much uh, oversight or internet or other things to call bullshit on it. So I think they got away with it. Right. No, no dash cams, no cell phone videos, no anything like that. Right. They probably watched the post reporter, you know. Well, there yeah. was actually an interesting, there was an actually an interesting bit on uh, NPR's Fresh Air recently about the, the myth of the Alamo, actually. Like, you know, uh, Texas will virulently defend that myth of, you know, Davy Crockett and you know, all the folks involved there. But, you know, when the same guys who did Barbarians at the Gate wrote a book on this and defined like these were po former politicians who were looking for the last vestiges of their career. And it created this mythos about like the creation of Texas and the Alamo. And these people are actually bad, but we we have revised history enough, enough so that governors of Texas have basically said, you know, you can't teach the truth as it would be, as it, you know, as the facts kind of come out. And those in other states that would actually tell that narrative that was based on fact and research, uh, you know, Texas would go after those states and those educational facilities, basically like, no, don't don't ruin this for us. This is this is our story. This is this is what we base our entire our, our entire kind of culture on this this uh, rugged independence and where it was literally like, you know, we were we were, you know, uh, you know, in Texas, they were they were wanting to like, you know, go against, uh, you know, they wanted slavery there. And the, the fact is, is that was the whole founding of Texas. It was like we wanted to preserve slavery and Mexico was anti-slavery. And it's, it's like this revisionist history thing. So we've been good at it, too. We've just kind of wrapped it in Americana, just like the Russians have in, in more of a, a state controlled, you know, Uber Allis type kind of thing, the way maybe. Yeah. Some, a Nazi Germany did a little bit about the the like the, absolutely yeah. like the lost cause mythos. Yeah, uh, I love where all of this is gone. I'm gonna go through where I uh, and get it. Uh, I think we're we started a little late, so we're gonna keep going through 8:40. So we have time for a few more questions. I've got one that is gonna take us a little 
bit more in a lighthearted direction, but also is dark in its own special way from Doug White. Uh, would a benevolent Colossus result in humanity becoming like the people on the Ark and Wally? <laughs> Film references, we love it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I yelled over you. <laughs> not not on grapefruit and two slices of bacon. We're not going to get that fat <laughs> if you have to exercise and do jumping jacks. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, but that's that's that that's a subcurrent of a lot of these dystopian movies. That even when the computer takes over for good, or whatever the entity takes over for good, and humankind is able to excel at scientific research and effort, other things. That because we're not challenged, we get lazy. We don't care. We don't, you know. There's there's multiple Star Trek episodes about this where the, uh, civilization just stops because there's nothing challenging them and they don't have to do anything. So yeah, maybe. And again, you know, I think about this as an algorithm is only as good as those who program it or the corpus that feeds it. So you know, you talk about a lot of these, uh, you know, AI or ML systems that you know maybe don't detect people uh, who are African American or, you know, have other issues with, with, you know, kind of addressing a lot of the individuality of like the population that we have. And it's because it's not, it's not fed the right data. It's not fed diverse data. Uh, the algorithm is maybe shortcutted because it comes from a certain perspective. And I think that's the thing with Colossus is you, you looked at the room there, there was, you know, Dr. Chin, and I forget the other character who I was highlighting there and, and a woman, like there, there was like a very, discrete minority in there and then a bunch of white guys i mean like of course colossus is going to take the the tact and the intelligence from the folks who programmed it there you know it's it's maybe has that 10 percent of somebody who has a diverse point of view and they're still going to get overruled i think you know we had that point where you know in the film where you know it was much like galaxy quest where you're dictating the commands to the to the computer you're not actually thinking for yourself, you're just kind of regurgitating things. And that is a trope within science fiction. Here, we kind of maybe saw the progenitor of it in a way. Yeah, I also, yeah. Uh, going back to like weird troubling dynamics and tropes that I wrote down in my notes, just gender dynamics colon yikes <laughs> in, for my initial re uh, watch through. And I think that reaction holds up upon a rewatch. Uh, so I didn't want to stop talking about this before addressing a little bit that it's like all workplace harassment and like a weird global national security <laughs> level like weird panopticons. Of, it needed more like, bourbon. It needed more bourbon. Uh, too much gin. You know, too much gin. For there was a lot okay. going on there or that like I, ooh, I wish they'd found another plot device for. And I got to say, the Colossus campus was almost like Apple or Google headquarters, where you just roll out of your bedroom into the like <laughs> IT control room. Well, yeah. Doc point one. Yeah, it's basically what that was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have to say, when Colossus did its global broadcast, to fill off what Emily was saying, like, you know, they were showing all those people in, oh, countries that weren't the US or Russia. And I was like, you're about to have a bad time. It has no idea what to do with you. It's based everything on like a totally different system than, than will be any good for you. Um, like we got to see a very narrow impact, right? On just a couple of incredibly, really privileged people. And so, um, that was my thought when they. I, I would love to see Colossus deal with Ludafisk. I mean, you know, like you know, some 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 kippered some kippered fish. Like, what do I do with this? This makes no sense. Error, error, error. You know. So yeah. As a Minnesotan, I would love if Ludafisk was the thing that broke Colossus. <laughs> As a sentient from Swedish Lutheran stock on the plains, same. <laughs> Love that we brought the Midwestern domination to this conversation. <laughs> yeah. uh, do we, uh, oh, I, I like this one from Rick Harris. In the 1960s and into the 1970s was sort of the beginning of popular anti-hero films where there were no winners. Who do we think won in Colossus? I think I think Rick's right. No one won. I think that's that's exactly the answer. But mm -hmm. but but I also think you know it sets it up as a binary choice. Um, and that we talked a little bit before, like you know, will we all be fat, dumb, and happy if if Colossus was a benevolent god? But you know, it, it goes back to what I said in the beginning. 
you know, there was a real Colossus, it was a computer, it actually helped save humankind. So we, you know, we have to mix the good with the bad. We have to look at this more, more I, I think, with a more critical eye, uh, but these movies are always gonna be binary. <laughs> I agree with the whole Colossus is a benevolent God and, you know, I'm gonna smite you down or, you know, turn you to salt or wax a city. Yeah, so very Old Testament very, very kind of God. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what unburied death. I mean, I love that phrase. You know, it could be it could be the peace of plenty or the peace of unburied death. That's a little strong. <laughs> so. Very biblical, though. Very, very, very biblical. biblical. Yeah. I would love to see a Rick and Morty episode like tackle this. Like I just watched the one this past <laughs> weekend. Like they've already done Zardoz, which I mentioned in the chat and whatnot. But I think Rick and Morty tackling uh, Colossus is, is, is some kind of low cultural influence on there it would be a total like win for the series. I think. I agree. Uh, you know, when you're talking about the shots of all the other people around the world, the other thing just on on gender that you might have noticed is all the shots of everyone around the world also seem to be all men, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was interesting to me. Uh, I and then we had like the little diversity yeah. crew of like the two women and like one black guy and James Hong. Oh, it, it said targeting countries and it said Africa and they went to like <laughs> Copenhagen. And I'm like, what did Copenhagen do to you? <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah, but Africa, like we're just gonna nuke Africa. Just like, all of it. Right, come on. All of it. <laughs> Well, they did. They did beat Russia in the uh, European final or European first round. So maybe that was the. <laughs> yeah. Oh. We are. I'm so pleased with all, all of this. We are probably getting close to wrapping up here, but I want to have a final call for any questions into the chat. Uh, now is your time. Shoot your shot. Uh, Otherwise, it looks like based on the chat, we will mostly be discussing Old Bay seasoning. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I'll ask a question to the panel. Is this a, uh, so many people haven't seen this movie. I think it's a classic. I think most people should. Should, should every tech policy person be forced to watch this movie or not forced to watch, but should they watch this movie? Or is that giving them too much of a dystopian view of life or in fact, is life more dystopian than this movie? <laughs> is this tying to a chair with a gag or just asking them kindly to do it? So. No, yeah, not, I feel not, like- It's not Clockwork Orange style with a little- like, <laughs> uh, I am not in favor of the Clockwork Orange method. I feel like that is a little extreme. <laughs> I think definitely it is on a cybersecurity and artificial intelligence uh, film class mm -hmm. screening syllabus, yeah. list it's a syllabus item uh but i am not in favor of world control <laughs> forcing us to all watch this movie uh so i'm gonna actually i'm gonna rebel against world control here <laughs> but i would I think, totally I think people should see it but a okay. lot of people have seen terminator already and terminator is the concept of computers taking over mm -hmm. i would love if they remade colossus that it'd be a lot more subtle you know you start getting amazon packages that you didn't order but you oh i guess i do i do want it and the computers slowly start running our lives that could be terrifying. I'd love to see a remake that was more along those lines. Mm -hmm. I kind of think Black Mirror is the, the intellectual uh, successor to Colossus. Definitely, I, I thought a lot about the social media as the same sort of panopticon and the parallels in the first episode of the first season there uh, in terms of like, who, you know, like, who's all like, computers being all seen versus like the capacity for overall surveillance already through like our existent systems. Yeah, I think honestly, you know, you know, the the problem du jour nowadays, obviously, at least in the zeitgeist, you know, keep using that word, but you know, the disinformation campaigns like, you know, to, to you know, one of the one of the interesting challenges about the human mind is that we can ho hold opposing thoughts multiple opposing thoughts in one brain but for a binary system at least of that age for colossus you know while it is ai you know to be able to to, to kind of work that out is, is challenging and i think maybe that is one of those things about noting how anachronistic it is in a way of here's here's where we were and here's where we've evolved to 
and to continue along the evolution. So I would use it as a base uh, base for the discussion, but not as a, well, this should guide you how you should develop policy. No, no uh, I, I would think not really guide you, but you know, one of the films that people should watch is sort of a primer and warning. Um, but also interestingly in this film, the technology community and the cybersecurity community seem to get along for a change, uh, even though they were both blind to the results they were creating. Yeah, who's pulling the 240 plug? I mean, come on, that, that you know, literally one, two, pull. You know, it's done, you know, end of story. Uh, and I appreciate, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, I appreciated Doug White making the point into bringing up uh, one of, I think many people's favorite privacy story is about Target sending mailers for maternity ads to someone and before, or that girl's teen father, like that teenage girl's father knew she was pregnant and him getting outraged. It's the center of a big narrative that was also then pulled out by, I, like as a really interesting aggravated story by Cashmere Hill that turned into this whole other spiral about journalism, Google it. Uh, but is also really, I think, telling about that point that we made earlier about uh, our digital siloing and echo chambers and how our choices are really what we are offer and also how that oh, like our interactions are then collected and fed into this larger system. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask you guys a question, but I thought it was fun. <laughs> um, but I know that we, <laughs> we have a really fun and active chat here and I, guys, and I love keeping up with it. Uh, I know we've also had a couple of, of call-outs to other films throughout here, a lot of Terminator people, which we've touched on, but also oh, call-outs to War Games and other really seminal tech policy films. Are there other any other or sort of last minute it call-outs that uh, y'all want to make before we go ahead and wrap things up here? A lot of people have posted the Andromeda strain and I just think that at least in the Andromeda strain, they put a nuclear weapon under that because they knew they might lose control of, of, of that. And it would have been bad for the movie, but uh, I think Colossus should have had a self-destruct button. And of course, that, that was the point. It couldn't be destroyed. If you unplugged it, if you pulled the 240, it would launch nukes. So that it was self <laughs> a mistake. 240 but... nuclear weapon, neither one's good. Yeah. Well, I was also thinking, was it... Um... Also, the, the the first it was it wasn't Endgame. It was, um, but the the next one to that I'm actually losing my Marvel cred here. But you know where, where oh no, it was yeah, so, geez, uh, Age of Ultron. You know where where uh, Jarvis's conscience went to go hide. You know that's a little bit of that pairing of of the the two and the you know Colossus and and whatnot. And this and in this movie is like, you know when it goes awry, like are they working in in conjunction or are they stealing from one another? And that that's another kind of film I would say to kind of look at like it's dystopian in like we are creating a shield to protect you but this is where that ai is you know one is more towards empathetic to the human race and the other one is you know taking that skewed skewed version i think that was also the film i was taking a look at where you have a nascent ai that looks at human history and goes well you're not worthy of survival so yeah similar i would recommend there's like so many films i recommend but i as i said i tweeted after i left the government one cyber movie a week for 72 weeks so there are lots of them. And I think they're grouped under pound cyber movie. Um, if you, if you want to look on Twitter, um, but there are good and bad ones. There are terrible ones like demon seed with Julie Christie. There, there are ones that are a little more uplifting. Um, uh, there are ones where the computer ends up being the hero, uh, but there are lots of them. And, you know, I, I recommend people look at that list. And I think there's some other lists on the internet and, and come back with some suggestions of what you think will work. Just remember, Obi Wan Kenobi was a hacker, uh, and we're certainly gonna be, I think, doing a bunch of other things as part of the Defrag Film Festival here at Columbia University. I'm gonna do one very last question, and because it came from um, Veer, -er, who is one of the organizers of this super excellent event, thank you to Veer -er for doing so much cool stuff with it is through the Tech and Cyber Support. Tech and cybersecurity policy the uh, project there. And the chat got so busy that I lost it now, which is a good problem to have. Three new messages. Now we've got all of the questions. 
Uh, but I believe it was, should technology come with a self-destruct button? Yes, should tech in the real world be built with self-destruct buttons? My answer to that is should people have self-destruct buttons because they're the ones that are often more predictable, more less predictable. Yeah, I don't know that it has to be a, you know, plastic cover over a red button kind of really dramatic <laughs> self-destruct button, but I think you should always know how to walk back what you put forward. Yeah, agree. Yeah, it's an unfair question. You know, I don't want my <laughs> car to have a self-destruct button, right? You know, I don't want the algorithm shipping me packages to have a self-destruct button. I mean, those are all pretty, pretty good things. We, we just got to like design our stuff to work. Yeah. Do you want to have like a button where it can at least be air gapped? Yeah. As someone said, <laughs> can you can you roll back to earlier firmware? <laughs> Again, I hate, to, I hate to say, you know, keep referring to Rick and Morty, but there's a really good episode where he, you know, he had a button where he could actually like reverse time to do decisions. And, and there was a whole parallel universe where, where the Mortys were actually being killed and replaced. So, you know, to understand, you know, you have this, but there are consequences to doing that rollback. Um, I think that's one of those things is that we, we have this idea that, that our decisions, uh, especially given that kind of power, have no implications, but when you kind of, you know, post facto say like, yeah, you killed like 130 Mortys. That's one of those things to give you pause about like, be very careful about the decisions you make. Um, not necessarily analysis through paralysis, but really kind of be thoughtful about the, the more holistic global scale about like what your decisions have on impact. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for, excuse me, you folks. I'm trying to get rid of guys in my conversation. It's a thing I'm working on. Thank you folks so much. This has been a wonderful open panel. Uh, I'm so excited to continue to, uh, to explore more of uh, the hacker ethos through film with DFRAT uh, and the University of Columbia uh, going forward with the rest of this film festival. More events soon. And speaking of more things, I'm going to kick it over to Bo Wood who helped organize this as well to say goodbye. Hey, hey, Bo, when you're finished talking, I want to hit one sound effect to play you out. Okay, <laughs> uh, can do. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This has been a really, really fun conversation. Uh, we're very happy that we had so many people come out and spend you know, several hours with us, um, which we, you, know, you probably wouldn't be willing to do uh, in real life. Uh, but you know, this is the power of being online when you can eat dinner while you're watching a, a fantastic film. Um, thank you to our panelists and our moderator. Uh, this has been an awesome discussion. I, I really want to see if we can take a lot of these questions to Twitter and maybe drop them through the defrag account, which if you're not already following it, go, uh, go click the subscribe button or whatever it is the kids say on YouTube these days. <laughs> um, it's uh, at Columbia defrag. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. Thank you, Veer, for dropping that into chat. Um, we are not yet on TikTok, uh, TBD for that one. Um, but we will have more content coming at you. We'd like to do a bunch of these uh, coming up, leading up to our fall event, which dates TBD as soon as the Lincoln Center opens back up or whatever venue we end up going to. Um, we are very, very excited to host more of these. Hopefully you're excited to attend more. And if you are, let us know. Uh, we, can, we can pull you into those conversations. So... Uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, special thanks to Hewlett and UBS for making this all happen. Uh, and of course, the Columbia team, uh, Veer, Sean, Jay, uh, Lance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I feel like the Oscar credits are now playing for me, but instead it's going to be Chris's sound effect. Come on, Chris. Emily's going to have to do it. All right. We, I, I, I'm having technical issues. Can I do a verbal imitation? The demo <laughs> gods have failed. Every time we hear a technology issue, I'm going like, see, this is why we don't need Colossus. This concludes the broadcast from World Control. There you go. <laughs> I, this is uh, Andrew Peterson, your uh, robot uh, voice of World Control for the event. And thanks so much again for everyone from Kansas Alps on Twitter or playinggreatproductions.com. Everybody else wants to promo where you can find them and remind... Indeed, uh, reminding you one more time, you can also find the entire film festival on Twitter or at uh, Deep Defra Columbia Defrag.